Hello YouTube and welcome to the third PTG Rail Routes Guide video. Routes Guides are documentary style videos recorded within Train Simulator where we take a look at one route in each video, learning facts and history about the route as well as looking at key points of interest. On today's video we will be taking a look at the Settle to Carlisle Line. The Settle to Carlisle line runs for 73 miles from Settle Junction near the town of Settle, where the line branches off from the Leeds to Morecambe line, right through to the city of Carlisle in Cumbria. Opened in 1875 for freight and 1876 for passengers, the route runs through some of the most remote areas of northern England. Notable for the beautiful scenery along the route, it is arguably the most famous railway journey in England. The line was born out of the railway politics of the 19th century, in the face of rivalry between the Midland Railway Company and the London and North Western Railway. There was a dispute between the two companies over access rights to the London and North Western Railway's route to Scotland. The board of the Midland Railway Company decided that the solution was to build a separate route through to Scotland. Surveying for the new route started in 1865, and parliamentary approval for the plans was granted in 1866. The estimated cost for the new route was £2.3 million, which is the equivalent to around £190 million in today's money. Due to a financial crisis at the time, the Midland Railway had second thoughts about the funding of the construction and petitioned Parliament to abandon the plans. However, Parliament refused and construction of the new route started in November 1869. Over 6,000 navvies were involved in the construction of the route, working in remote locations and often enduring harsh weather conditions. They were housed in large camps, with the remains of the camp at Batty Green, which housed over 2,000 navvies, still visible near Ribblehead. When the route was constructed, it was built to mainline express standards, which meant minimising the gradients wherever possible. This necessitated the construction of 14 tunnels and 22 viaducts. However, there is an almost constant 1 in 100 or 1% 1 grade climbing north from Settle for the next 16 miles to Blee Moor. This climb has been nicknamed the Long Drag. The construction of the route ran over budgets by around 50%, coming to a total cost of around £3.6 million, which is £300 million by today's standards. The route opened to freight traffic in August 1875, with passenger services starting in April 1876. During the 1980s, British Rail made plans to close the line which were met with considerable protest. This helped to raise awareness of the route and market it to a wider audience. The resulting publicity significantly increased passenger traffic, with much of this increase attributable to tourism and pleasure travellers. Ultimately, the line was saved from closure and remains open to this day. Passenger services are provided by Northern Rail, though a number of rail tours also use the line. It is also used as a diversionary route for the West Coast Main Line when the West Coast Main Line is closed for engineering work. Due to the history of the Settle to Carlisle Line, as well as its use for both rail tours and as a diversionary route for the West Coast Main Line, it is possible to demonstrate a wide variety of trains and liveries in this video. We start our tour of the route here at Settle Junction. Settle Junction is where the Settle to Carlisle line diverges away from the Leeds to Morecambe route. There was a station located here, which opened just five months after the Settle to Carlisle line, as an interchange station between the two routes. The predicted traffic at the station failed to materialise, in part due to the extremely rural location. This resulted in the station being closed just one year after opening, on the 1st of November 1877. The signal box here controls the junction, as well as the block sections towards Hellefield in the south, Bleemore sidings in the north, and Carnforth station junction to the northwest.
The block section between Settle Junction and Carnforth Station Junction is the longest on the National Rail Network at 24 miles, and this significantly limits capacity on the route. Just under two miles north of Settle Junction, we arrive at the market town of Settle. Settle has a population of 2,564 people, making it one of the more populous locations on the route. The town is situated around 41.5 miles north of Leeds and 71 miles south of Carlisle. The station here was opened with the line on the 1st of May 1876 and was originally called Settle New. This was to distinguish it from the nearby Settle station on the Leeds to Morecambe route, which was renamed Settle Old at the same time. Settle New was renamed Settle on the 1st of July 1879, after Settle Old station had been renamed Giggleswick. The footbridge linking the platforms at Settle Station was formerly located at Drem Station on the East Coast Main Line in Scotland, until electrification of the East Coast Main Line made the bridge redundant. It was then dismantled and moved to Settle in 1993. The old station signal box, which was abolished in 1984, has since been restored as a visitor attraction by the Friends of the Settle to Carlisle Line. Just north of Settle Station, we encounter the first tunnel on the route, which is the 120-yard-long Stainforth Tunnel. This was originally called Taitland's Tunnel. After this, we follow the path of the River Ribble, crossing it a total of three times, before arriving at the village of Horton in Ribblesdale. Horton in Ribblesdale is a village which lays around six miles north of Settle. The village has a population of just 428 people, which is a fairly average size for the towns and villages along the route. It is located close to Penny Ghent, which is one of the mountains of the Yorkshire Three Peaks. During the 1950s and 1960s, the station won the Best Kept Station Award for 17 years consecutively. Like most of these stations along the line, Horton in Ribblesdale was closed to passengers on the 4th of May 1970. It was reopened again in July 1986, along with a number of other stations which had previously been closed. Just over four and a half miles north of Horton in Ribblesdale, we come to Ribblehead Station. Ribblehead Station is located at the southern end of Ribblehead Viaduct. The station doesn't serve any notable population, apart from a handful of houses in the area. The station opened with the route in 1876, and like most stations on the route, was closed in 1970. After closure, the northbound platform was demolished to make way for the construction of transfer sidings for a nearby quarry. These sidings still exist, and more recently they have been restored for use by timber trains. The station was reopened in 1986, and a replacement platform for the demolished one was constructed in 1993, slightly to the south of the original site. The station is now leased by the Settle and Carlisle Railway Trust, who have carried out extensive restoration and refurbishment. There is now a visitor centre at Ribblehead Station, which includes exhibits about the history of the line and the battle to save it from closure. Nearby Ribblehead Viaduct is possibly the most iconic and famous structure on the line. The viaduct was built to cross Batty Moss in the valley of the River Ribble. The viaduct is 440 yards long and 104 feet in height at the highest point. The foundations go 25 feet into the ground and the viaduct has a total of 24 arches. It is now a Grade 2 listed structure. The first stone in the construction of the viaduct was laid on the 12th of October 1870, with the last stone being laid in 1874. It took a team of 1,000 navvies to build the viaduct, often in harsh conditions. In total, 
over 1.5 million bricks were laid, with some of the limestone blocks weighing as much as 8 tonnes. Unfortunately, around 100 of the navvies lost their lives during the construction. The bridge opened to goods traffic on the 3rd of August 1875, with passenger traffic following on the 1st of May 1876, after inspection and approval of the works. In the 1980s, one of the reasons British Rail stated that they wanted to close the line is because the viaduct had fallen into a state of disrepair, was deemed to be unsafe, and repairs were deemed to have cost too much money. One solution was the singling of the track across the viaduct in 1985, preventing two trains crossing the viaduct at the same time. A 20 mile per hour speed restriction was also imposed. The viaduct was eventually repaired and maintained after the proposals to close the line had been abandoned. After Ribblehead Viaduct, the next major structure we come to is Bleemore Tunnel. At 1 mile 880 yards in length, it is the longest tunnel on the line, being almost double the length of the second longest tunnel. The tunnel took more than four years to construct, and seven separate construction shafts were sunk from the moor above, so the work could be done. Four of these shafts have since been filled in, but three have been retained to aid with tunnel ventilation. It passes as much as 500 feet below the moor which the tunnel is named after. Heading north, away from Bleemore Tunnel, the line then passes over the 199 yard long Dent Head Viaduct, closely followed by the 220 yard long Artengill Viaduct, before arriving at the station of Dent. Dent Station sits just over 6 miles north of Ribblehead and serves two small villages, the village of Calgill, which is around half a mile from the station, and the village of Dent, which is just under 5 miles away. The station sits at an altitude of 1,150 feet, making it the highest railway station on the National Railway Network in England. The station buildings here are now privately owned and operated as holiday cottages. The only way of accessing the down platform is by way of a foot crossing, and as a result there is a 30 mile per hour speed restriction in place here. For the majority of the routes, the ruling speed limit is 60 miles per hour. Dent Station opened over a year after the line was opened to passenger traffic, on the 6th of August 1877. It was later closed by British Rail on the 4th of May 1970, before being reopened again in 1986. Heading north away from Dent, the next major structure we come to is the 1,213 yard long Rise Hill Tunnel. At around three quarters of a mile in length, this makes it the second longest tunnel on the line. After passing Rise Hill Tunnel, we arrive at Garsdale. Garsdale Station is around three and a quarter miles north of Dent, and it serves the hamlet of Garsdale Head, as well as the nearby towns of Sedbra and Hawes. The station here was opened on the 1st of August 1876, and was originally called Hawes Junction. This was renamed as Hawes Junction and Garsdale on the 20th of January 1900, before finally being renamed simply as Garsdale on the 1st of September 1932. The name Hawes Junction was adopted as this was the location for the junction between the Settle to Carlisle line and a branch line through to Hawes. The branch was closed in 1959. Like most other stations on the route, Garsdale was closed by British Rail in 1970, only to be reopened again in 1986. In steam days, the highest water troughs in the world were located near Garsdale. Leaving Garsdale, the line next crosses the 227 yard long Dandry Mire or Moorcock Viaduct. After this, the line then passes through three tunnels, the 98 yard long Moorcock Tunnel, the 106 yard long Shotlock Hill Tunnel, and the 424 yard long Burkitt Tunnel. 
Between Shotlock Hill Tunnel and Burkitt Tunnel, the route passes Aysgill Summit, which is the highest point on the line, at 1,169 feet above sea level. In the area around Aysgill, a total of three different railway accidents have occurred. In the early hours of the morning of the 24th of December 1910, one of the most serious railway accidents on the route happened. The signalman forgot that he had a pair of light locos waiting at the down signal for clearance to return to Carlisle when he cleared the preceding signals for the down Scotch Express into the same section. As a consequence of this, the down Scotch Express collided with the light locos. The resulting crash was made worse by the wooden construction of the coaches, with the ruptured gas pipes which fed the lighting catching fire, with the fire then being fuelled by the wood from the coaches. Out of the 56 people on board, 12 lost their lives and a further 17 were injured. There was another accident in this area a couple of miles further to the north just three years later in 1913. In this case, two trains had both left Carlisle heading south, and both were underpowered for the load they were carrying. The train in front struggled on the climb up towards Aysgill Summit, before finally stalling a mile before the summit itself, when the driver and fireman were unable to maintain enough boiler pressure to keep the brakes off. Whilst the train was stopped and they tried to regain boiler pressure, the train behind was slowly catching up. Also underpowered, the load on the second train was lighter, and so it was having less problems with the climb. The driver walked onto the outside of the loco to oil some of the parts while the train was moving, before getting back into the cab to assist the fireman with a faulty injector. During this time, the train passed the signals at danger which were guarding the train in front, missed a red lantern waved by the signalman as well as one waved by the guard of the first train, and then collided into the back of the first train. Out of 166 passengers, there were 16 fatalities and a further 38 injuries. The final accident to happen in this area was on the evening of the 31st of January 1995, when a Class 156 Super Sprinter DMU was derailed by a landslip. It was a very dark night with very heavy rain. The Class 156 had already travelled from Carlisle to Ribblehead, but had to turn around there and return to Carlisle due to flooding further along the line. On the way back to Carlisle, near Aysgill Summit, the train hit the landslide and ended up derailed across both tracks. The guard escorted passengers to the rear of the unit, and the driver changed the train's headlights to red to warn any oncoming trains. The driver also made a radio call to crew control room to inform them of the incident. However, another train was heading towards Ribblehead from the north, and around a quarter of the mile from the site of the derailment saw the red lights of the train ahead. The driver made an emergency brake application, but was unable to stop in time and collided with the derailed train. There were over 30 injuries, but thankfully there was only one fatality. Moving away from Aysgill, after the line has passed through Burkitt Tunnel, we then encounter the next town on the route at Kirkby Stephen. The station here at Kirkby Stephen is almost 10 miles north of Garsdale. It was previously called Kirkby Stephen West to differentiate it from the nearby Kirkby Stephen East station on the Stainmore and Eden Valley lines. Kirkby Stephen East station is now closed. Kirkby Stephen West Station was closed by British Rail in 1970, before being reopened again in 1986 as Kirkby Stephen. The station was extensively restored in 2009 by the Settle and Carlisle Railway Trust. The station serves the town of Kirkby Stephen, which is located around a mile away. The town has a population of 1,822 people, making it the most populous location we have encountered since leaving Settle.
After leaving Kirkby Stephen, we encounter a number of major structures, as well as the locations of two closed stations, before the line reaches the next station. The first structure we come to is the 237-yard long Smardale Viaduct, which crosses Scandalbeck. At 130 feet in height, it is the highest viaduct on the line. It was constructed using local limestone and millstone grit, and over 60,000 tonnes of stone was required. The viaduct took around five years to construct, and opened in August 1875. Next, the line passes through the 181-yard-long Crosby Garrett Tunnel. After this, the line then crosses the 6-arch, 110-yard-long Crosby Garrett Viaduct, before arriving at the site of the first closed station on the route, at Crosby Garrett. The station here was opened in 1876, and served the nearby village of the same name. The British Railways Board closed the station in 1952 as an economic cost-cutting measure. Today, the village has a population of just 195 people. The station platforms were built into a cutting, and this required large retaining walls which can still be seen today. However, little remains of the station itself. After Crosby Garrett, the next major structure we encounter is the 571-yard-long Helm Tunnel. Emerging from the tunnel, the line then passes the site of the next closed station at Ormside. Ormside Station served the civil parish of Ormside, which includes the village of Great Ormside, along with the hamlet of Little Ormside. Together, they have a combined population of 167 people. Original proposals for the line were for there to be a station at the nearby civil parish of Asby. This was later changed to Ormside, with the station opening in 1876. The British Transport Commission closed the station in 1952, and the platforms were completely demolished. The station building survives today as a private dwelling, however, this hasn't been included in Train Simulator. Leaving Ormside behind, the line then crosses the 200-yard Ormside Viaduct, before arriving at the town of Appleby. The town of Appleby in Westmoreland is one of the major towns on the route. Between Settle and Carlisle, Appleby was the only station to survive closure by British Rail in the 1970s. The town has a population of 3,048 people, and it is around 30 and a half miles southeast of Carlisle, 40 miles north of Settle, and 10 and a half miles from the previous station at Kirkby Stephen. With over 60,000 people using the station each year, Appleby Station is one of the busiest on the line. Much of this traffic can be attributed to tourism. The annual horse fair held here each June is a tradition dating back to the 12th century, and it draws a lot of people into the town. The station here opened with the line on the 1st of May 1876, and on the 1st of September 1952, it was renamed Appleby West. This name change was to differentiate it from the now-closed Appleby East station on the nearby Eden Valley Railway. After the closure of Appleby East Station, Appleby West was renamed as Appleby on the 6th of May 1968. There is a water tower located here, which is used for steam locos operating on rail tours. There is a junction just past the station, which leads to what was the Eden Valley Railway, though today it only runs for around a quarter of a mile to a dead end. Here you can see an old map of how the railway used to look at Appleby, with the link to the Eden Valley Railway included. The Eden Valley Railway is currently in development for Train Simulator by Steam Sound Supreme. Leaving Appleby behind, the line then passes a number of points of interest before we arrive at the next station. The next location we come to is the site of another closed station at Long Martin. 
Long Martin Station opened with the line on the 1st of May 1876 and was closed by British Rail in 1970. It was built to serve the village of Long Martin, which today has a population of 827 people. The station buildings here were subsequently sold and have been converted to private residences. The platforms here were demolished in the 1970s, though they appear to have been included in Train Simulator. Shortly after Long Martin, there is a 30 mile per hour speed restriction in force. This was due to embankment slippage causing problems, and so a speed limit lower than the ruling 60 mile per hour speed limit had to be enforced. However, today the problem has been rectified, and so trains can once again pass through here at 60 miles per hour. Next, we encounter the British Gypsum Works in the civil parish of Kirkby Thor, around 5 miles from Appleby, and only 8 miles from Penrith, which the West Coast Main Line passes through. Gypsum has been mined in this area for over 200 years, and British Gypsum operate a private siding here, which joins onto the Settle to Carlisle line. We now come to the site of the next closed station on the route, at New Biggin. The station here was built to serve the civil parish of the same name, and like so many other stations on the route it was opened in 1876 and closed by British Rail in 1970. The platforms were demolished, but one of the station buildings survives and is now a private residence. The population of New Biggin as of the year 2001 was just 96 people. A short distance from New Biggin is the site of yet another closed station at Colgaith. The station here was built to serve the village of the same name and opened a few years after the line on the 1st of April 1880. The station then remained open for just over 90 years, being closed by British Rail on the 4th of May 1970. The level crossing and signalling here are still controlled by the old station signal box. Like many of the other closed stations on the line, the station building has been converted into a private residence. Only part of the southbound down platform survives, with the northbound up platform having been completely demolished. Today, the village of Colgate has a population of 826 people. After passing Colgate, the line then heads through the 661 yard long Colgate Tunnel. Very shortly followed by the 164 yard long Waste Bank Tunnel. We then arrive at the site of the next station on the route, Langworthby. Langworthby is almost exactly 11 miles from Appleby, 19 and a half miles from Carlisle, and just 5 miles from Penrith. The station was opened in 1876 and was built to serve Langworthby Village, which today has a population of 866 people. The station here was closed in 1970 and reopened again in 1986. The station building on the southbound down platform has been converted into tea rooms and an antique shop. The village is home to one of the helicopters run by the Great North Air Ambulance Service, called Pride of Cumbria. After leaving Langworthby, the line passes the site of another disused station at Little Solkeld. The station here was built to serve the villages of Little Solkeld and Great Solkeld. Like so many of the other stations on the route, it was opened with the line in 1876 and closed by British Rail in 1970. The station building here was later converted to a private residence. There was a branch line from here to Long Meg Mine, now a disused gypsum mine, which also closed in the 1970s. Following the route away from Little Solkeld, the line then passes through the 99-yard-long Lazenby Tunnel, before arriving at the station of Lazenby and Kirkerswold. 
Lazenby and Kirkerswold station serves both the villages of Lazenby and the village of Kirkerswold, with a combined population of 1,877 people. The station is around four and a quarter miles from the previous station at Langworthby, and just under 15 and a half miles from Carlisle. When the station opened in 1876, it was originally named Lazenby. It was later renamed as Lazenby and Kirkerswold on the 22nd of July 1895. The station was closed in 1970, though continued to see occasional use by Dales Rail excursions. It was fully reopened again in 1986. Heading away from Lazenby and Kirkerswold, the line then continues to head through the Eden Valley, running close to the River Eden, which it actually has been doing since passing Aysgill Summit. The route then passes through three tunnels on the way to the next station. The first is the 207 yard long Barren Wood Tunnel No. 1, almost immediately followed by the 251 yard long Barren Wood Tunnel No. 2. After a short distance, the line then heads through the 325 yard long Armathwaite Tunnel. After Armathwaite Tunnel, the line then passes over the 9 arch 176 yard long Armathwaite Viaduct before finally arriving at Armathwaite Station. Since the closure of the next three stations between Armathwaite and Carlisle, the station here is the last stop for passenger trains before arriving at Carlisle. Opening in 1876 before being closed in 1970, the station here was built to serve the village of Armathwaite. The village is split between two parishes, Ainstable and Hesketh, with a combined population of 2,992 people. When the station was reopened again in 1986, the station building had already been sold privately, and so a new passenger shelter was built at the other end of the platform. Armathwaite Station is just under five and a half miles from Lazenby and Kirkerswold, and just under ten miles from Carlisle. As the line heads away from Armathwaite, it's not long before we encounter the site of the first of the three closed stations between Armathwaite and Carlisle at Coat Hill. The station here was named after the nearby small village of Coat Hill, which is around one and a half miles away. Opened in 1876, Coat Hill Station was closed in 1952. The station was demolished, though some of the buildings remain. After Coat Hill, the next closed station we encounter is at the small village of Cum Winton. The station here was opened in 1876 and closed to passengers in 1956. The station including the platform survive and the old station building which is now a private residence has become a grade 2 listed building. The third and final closed station we encounter before Carlisle is at the village of Scottsby. The station here was first opened in 1876 and closed in 1959 as part of a cost-cutting exercise. The platforms have since been demolished, but like at many other stations, the former buildings here were sold on privately. On the approach to Carlisle, the route crosses Petterill Bridge Junction, which is where the route joins the Tyne Valley line from Newcastle. At London Road Junction, the two tracks merge into one single track, whilst the Carlisle avoiding lines diverge to the left. The line then rounds a sharp right-hand curve on an upward gradient and is joined by a siding on the right. When driving in the opposite direction, this gives the illusion that the route around this curve is double track, when in fact it's single. The route then joins the West Coast Main Line at Carlisle South Junction before arriving at Carlisle Station. Being situated on the West Coast Main Line, Carlisle Station has a different history to the other stations on the Settle to Carlisle Line. Carlisle Station was opened as Carlisle Citadel Station on the 1st of September 1847 and serves the city of Carlisle. At the time, there were a number of different stations in the city. But by 1851, 
Carlisle Citadel had become the main station. In 1875, the station was expanded and extended to provide additional capacity for trains. The station was renamed Carlisle after the nationalisation of the railways in 1948. The station itself is now a Grade 2 listed building. Carlisle is 102 miles south of Glasgow in Scotland, which is the northern end of the West Coast Main Line, and 299 miles north of London Euston, which is the southern end of the West Coast Main Line. The city is very close to Scotland, with the Scottish border being around 10 miles to the north. The city has a population of 75,306 people, increasing to 107,524 if we also include the number of people living in the surrounding area. The railway station is a junction station with a number of different routes leaving the city. The main route through the station is the West Coast Main Line, with express services coming from London and the south and heading towards Glasgow or Edinburgh to the north. Leaving the station to the south are the routes towards Settle and Leeds, as well as the route towards Newcastle, which is known as the Tyne Valley Line. Also departing to the south is the Cumbrian Coast Line, which follows the coast around Cumbria for over 85 miles to the town and port of Barrow in Furness. Departing to the north are trains towards Glasgow along the Glasgow South Western Line, which diverges away from the West Coast Main Line at Gretna Junction in the area of the Scottish border and heads through Dumfries towards Glasgow Central. Train operating companies which run services to Carlisle include Virgin Trains on West Coast Main Line services between London, Birmingham, Glasgow and Edinburgh, First Transpennine Express on services between Manchester and along the West Coast Main Line towards Glasgow and Edinburgh. Abellio Scott Rail on the Glasgow South Western Line for services between Carlisle, Dumfries, Kilmarnock and Glasgow. Northern Rail on services between Carlisle and Newcastle on the Tyne Valley Line. On services between Carlisle and Leeds via Settle on the Settle to Carlisle line, and on services between Carlisle, Whitehaven, and Barrow in Furness on the Cumbrian Coast line. Caledonian sleeper services also pass through Carlisle. In addition to this, a number of freight companies run services through the station along the West Coast Main Line. Royal Mail Class 325s also pass through here on services between London, Warrington and Glasgow. Finally, let's conclude this video with a bit of history about Carlisle itself. There has been a settlement at Carlisle since Roman times, originally established to serve the forts around Hadrian's Wall, which was then the northern limits of the Roman Empire. People often mistakenly believe that Hadrian's Wall marks the border between England and Scotland, yet the wall passes through England, and towards the eastern end it's as much as 68 miles south of the Scottish border. By the year 1066, Carlisle had become a part of Scotland. However, in 1092, the son of William the Conqueror, William Rufus, invaded the area and took Cumberland and Carlisle for England. After this, Carlisle then gained a rather turbulent history, with many battles between England and Scotland being fought in the area and seeing the area change hands on numerous occasions. After the Act of Union in 1707, Carlisle ceased being a frontier town in the wars between England and Scotland. Today, Carlisle is the county town of Cumbria, as well as being the only city in the county. And on that note, that brings us to the end of this episode, so I really just wanted to say thank you for watching, I really do hope that you have enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy it, then please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please don't forget that for the latest updates, you can find me on Facebook, with the link to my Facebook page in the description of this video. Once again, thank you for watching.